Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach verse by verse through the book of Hebrews, and I've got this brand new 200 plus page book on Hebrews out. This is a hardcover edition, and this is actually my uh, living commentary, a digital commentary that I have on over 27,000 verses in the Bible, and it's just printed out the uh, portion of the footnotes that are in the book of Hebrews. So this is the first time we've ever made this offer. This is going to be really powerful. I would encourage you to, to get this. We're asking for a donation of some amount for that. And then we also have CDs, DVDs, and a USB that are taken directly from this teaching. And I said this many times during this series, but the book of Hebrews is just absolutely essential to transition from the old covenant way of relating to God to the new covenant way. And we really are just into the uh, kind of the beginning of the book of Hebrews. There's a total of 13 chapters. We're in the sixth chapter. And then the seventh chapter, he gets, he lays one of the foundational truths that just totally makes the old covenant and the new covenant incompatible. Now, they don't contradict each other. The old covenant predicted the coming of a new covenant, so they aren't, incom they aren't contradictory, but they are incompatible. You cannot serve God under the Old Testament mindset and still take advantage of all of the benefits of the new covenant. And this is exactly why so many Christians struggle in their relationship with the Lord because they don't understand the fullness of the new covenant that's been given us. So anyway, we've already covered a lot of material. In the first part of Hebrews chapter 6, uh, the author told him, says, you need to leave the basic foundational truths and you need to go on unto maturity because if a person who's already been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and been a partaker of the Holy Ghost and has tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. I ministered on that last Friday and Monday and talked about that, and I'm going to have to skip over this or I'll go back into it, but it was radical, the things that I'm saying. I believe that most of the body of Christ does either comes on one side or the other where they believe that you are once saved, always saved, or you're saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost. Every time you sin, you lose your salvation and have to be born again. And I believe that there's a third option, and that is that you can't lose your salvation. Sin doesn't cause you to lose your salvation, but you can renounce it one time only if you are a mature Christian. An immature Christian wouldn't be held accountable for making some uh, radical, stupid statement against the Lord. But if you are a mature Christian and you renounce your faith, it's impossible to renew you under repentance again. So that's what we've already covered. And then in verse 7, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7, it says, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. So in the first few verses of this sixth chapter, he had told them to leave the basic things because they need to go on unto maturity, and there's no reason preaching about repentance from dead works and getting born again to people who have already been born again. It, with the exception of somebody who might renounce their faith. And then he said, but we're persuaded better things of you. So he wasn't really speaking directly to these people. He was just putting down what would happen if a person who was mature was to renounce their faith. And then in verse 10, this is a verse that I use often when I sign books and send uh, things to people and stuff because this is this is just really powerful. It says in verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have showed towards his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. You know, there's a lot of people that honestly just don't recognize. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, and whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, 
Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. You know, that's amazing. The Lord takes notice of even the smallest little thing that is done. And many times, you know, we hear people talking about all of the great things that are being done. Ministries talk about how many people they're meeting, ministering to, and they talk about millions and, and all of these things. And sometimes we just lose sight that the Lord takes notice of even giving a cup of cold water to a person. If you bless somebody in the name of the Lord, the slightest little thing, God takes notice of that. And I think that this is really important. There's a lot of people that because they are never going to be on television, they're never going to be one of the ones that everybody knows their name. It just makes them feel insignificant and they don't realize that God is taking account of every little thing that is done. I mean, every little thing. And I think that sometimes we get too focused on all of the great things and forget that there's a lot of people that they may not have the same platform, they may not reach as many people, but God is taking account of every little thing that is done. I think that's awesome. You know, to think that God Almighty, who's got a universe to run and billions of people talking about Him, calling out to Him, asking for help, and all of these things, and yet He pays attention to the slightest little thing that we do. And I think many times we just don't recognize this. You know, I try and tell my partners all of the time that everything that is being accomplished through this ministry is getting put to their account. And someday in heaven, they're going to have people come to them and thank them and they're and they're going to say, when did I ever impact you? They're going to have people from other continents, other cultures, people that they never personally met, and they will have people come by their mansion in heaven and thank them. And it's because when they gave to this ministry or to any ministry who's touching and changing lives, then you become a partaker of everything. And we couldn't do what we're doing without people that support us. These stations that you're watching this program upon, did you know each one of those stations, the people who give and become a partner with those networks or those individual stations, did you know every one of you is going to reap rewards from those things that are done? And I tell you, many times we just forget this and we feel insignificant and think, what, is my, uh, what am I doing? Am I making a difference? I think we're making a bigger difference than what we realize. And so this is a verse that I just use a lot for myself and for other people, that God is not unrighteous. It would be unrighteous on His part if He didn't pay attention to even the smallest kindness that we do to somebody else. And I tell you, we need more of this. You know, at one of the signs of the end times, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it lists, I think it's 16 or 19 things there. And some of those things is that they will be unthankful and unholy. People just won't be thankful. And when you just start thanking people, when you go around and just tell somebody that you're a blessing, thank you for what you've done, I tell you, God notices that. I really want to emphasize that because I just think that there's a lot of people that honestly are letting the devil tell them that they're insignificant because today in our media, we only glorify the people who are doing the great things that are affecting you know, large numbers of people, but God looks at even the smallest little deed that people do. That should be an encouragement to you. And I often sign books and put this in there that God will not forget the things that you've done and the labor of love which you have shown towards His name in that you minister to the saints and do minister. Boy, God notices all of that. In verse 11, it says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Do you know the Greek word that was used here for slothful? I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but it means sluggish. That is literally lazy or figuratively stupid. <laughs> That's the definition of it in the Strong's uh, Concordance. And so this is saying that He doesn't want us to be sluggish, lazy, or stupid. Did you know that you need to be diligent in whatever it is, whatever lane that God has given you, you need to be diligent and you need to give it everything that you've got. I tell you, there's so many people that are just doing the least amount that it takes to get through with something and that's not 
what the Scripture teaches. It says that we ought to do everything heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man because God pays attention to that and we receive a reward directly from God regardless of whether people recognize what we're doing or not. That's out of Ephesians chapter 6. And notice that it said here in that verse 12, it says that you should not be slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You know, we could spend a lot of time on this trying to define what all of it, what faith is and what patience is, but here's just some real quick things that the Lord has shown me that patience is faith. It's just faith over a prolonged period of time. There are some people that in a certain service when the music is just right and maybe somebody has done something and, in, in, you know, all of the planets align and stuff, they just get a surge of faith and all of a sudden they believe God. BUT YOU CAN GET TO A PLACE TO WHERE YOU JUST LIVE BY FAITH CONSTANTLY, AND I THINK THAT PATIENCE IS NOTHING BUT FAITH OVER A PROLONGED PERIOD OF TIME. ONE OF THE VERSES THAT I BELIEVE VERIFIES THAT IS OVER IN ROMANS CHAPTER 15 WHERE IT SAYS THAT uh, PATIENCE COMES THROUGH THE WORD OF GOD. AND SO uh, FAITH COMES BY HEARING THE WORD OF GOD. ROMANS CHAPTER 10, VERSE 17, ROMANS 15, 4, PATIENCE COMES BY SCRIPTURE. SO THEY BASICALLY COME THE SAME WAY. AND AGAIN, I THINK PATIENCE IS JUST A PROLONGED FORM OF FAITH. AND THAT'S REALLY IMPORTANT THAT WE HAVE PATIENCE. IT SAYS IN JAMES CHAPTER 1 THAT WE HAVE TO LET PATIENCE HAVE HER PERFECT WORK THAT WE MAY BE PERFECT AND ENTIRE WANTING NOTHING. AND I TELL YOU, PATIENCE IS IN SHORT SUPPLY IN MOST PEOPLE'S LIVES. BUT THIS IS SAYING THAT WE THROUGH FAITH AND PATIENCE INHERIT THE PROMISES. THERE ARE SOME PEOPLE THAT WILL GET, AGAIN, IN A SERVICE WHERE THEY GET INSPIRED AND THEY BELIEVE GOD JUST MOMENTARILY, BUT ARE YOU ABLE TO STICK WITH THAT FAITH OVER A PROLONGED PERIOD OF TIME? THAT'S WHAT FAITH, PATIENCE IS. IN VERSE 13, IT SAYS, FOR WHEN GOD MADE PROMISE TO ABRAHAM BECAUSE HE COULD SWEAR BY NO GREATER, HE SWEAR BY HIMSELF, SAYING, SURELY, BLESSING, I WILL BLESS THEE, AND MULTIPLYING, I WILL MULTIPLY THEE. THIS IS ACTUALLY A QUOTATION FROM GENESIS CHAPTER 22 AFTER ABRAM HAD OFFERED UP ISAAC, HIS SON, AND HE WAS WILLING TO SACRIFICE HIM, AND GOD STOPPED HIM RIGHT BEFORE HE KILLED HIS SON AND OFFERED HIM AS A SACRIFICE, AND GOD SHOWED HIM A RAM THAT WAS CAUGHT BY HIS HORNS IN A THICKET, AND HE OFFERED THE RAM INSTEAD. AND WHEN THE LORD SAW THIS, HERE'S WHAT IT SAYS IN GENESIS CHAPTER 22, VERSE 16, IT SAYS, AND SAID, BY MYSELF I HAVE SWORN, SAITH THE LORD, FOR BECAUSE THOU HAST DONE THIS THING AND HAST NOT WITHHELD THY SON, THINE ONLY SON, THAT IN BLESSING I WILL BLESS THEE, AND IN MULTIPLYING I WILL MULTIPLY THY SEED AS THE STARS OF HEAVEN AND AS THE SAND WHICH IS UPON THE SEA SHORE, AND THY SEED SHALL POSSESS THE GATE OF HIS ENEMIES, AND IN THY SEED SHALL ALL THE NATIONS OF THE EARTH BE BLESSED, BECAUSE THOU HAST OBEYED MY VOICE. AND SO GOD HERE SWORE BY HIMSELF. AND, YOU KNOW, IT GOES ON TO SAY DOWN HERE IN JUST A FEW VERSES THAT GOD CAN'T LIE. GOD DIDN'T SWEAR BY HIMSELF THAT HE WAS GOING TO BLESS ABRAHAM FOR HIS SAKE. IT WASN'T TO BIND HIM TO THIS OATH BECAUSE GOD CAN'T LIE. BUT GOD KNEW OUR FRAILITY. GOD KNEW THAT WE ARE PRONE TO DOUBT. AND SO JUST TO STRENGTHEN OUR FAITH AND GIVE US EVEN MORE ASSURANCE, HE MADE AN OATH. HE SWEAR BY HIMSELF THAT HE WOULD BLESS HIM. AND THEN IN VERSE 15 IT SAYS, AND SO AFTER HE HAD PATIENTLY ENDURED, HE OBTAINED THE PROMISE. AND THIS ALL GOES BACK TO THE SCRIPTURE WHERE IT SAYS THAT THROUGH FAITH AND PATIENCE THEY INHERIT THE PROMISE. AND THEN HE'S USING ABRAHAM NOW AS AN EXAMPLE. AND, YOU KNOW, MOST PEOPLE DON'T REALLY STUDY ENOUGH TO GET THESE THINGS, BUT ABRAHAM WAS 75 YEARS OLD WHEN HE ENTERED INTO THE PROMISED LAND, AND YET HE WAS 100 YEARS OLD WHEN HE HAD HIS uh, SON, ISAAC, AND THEN HE WAS SOMEWHERE AROUND 117 YEARS OLD OR MAYBE 120 YEARS OLD WHEN HE OFFERED UP ISAAC, AND THIS uh, PROMISE FROM GOD CAME THAT HE WOULD INHERIT THESE LANDS AND HIS CHILDREN WOULD BE AS NUMEROUS AS THE STARS IN THE SKY OR THE SANDS OF SEA, THE SAND ON THE SEASHORE. AND YET ABRAHAM LIVED TO BE 175. SO it, FOR A HUNDRED YEARS AT LEAST, ABRAHAM NEVER SAW THE FULFILLMENT OF GOD'S PROMISES TO HIM. HE SAW A PARTIAL FULFILLMENT. HE SAW THIS MIRACULOUS BIRTH OF ISAAC 
And so that was a partial fulfillment. But the thing is, seeing his children as numerous as the stars in the sky or the grains of sand on the seashore, he never saw that in his lifetime. And it was a hundred years. And he's using this as an example that after he had patiently endured, he inherited the promises. Boy, there's a lesson to be learned here. There are so many people that they will believe God, but if it doesn't come within, you know, an hour or, or a day or something, whatever, relatively short period of time, there's a lot of Christians that just give up and say, well, I prayed and I believed and nothing happened. Abraham stood for a hundred years without seeing the total fulfillment of what God had told him. And you could just go on and on and on through uh, different characters in the Bible that it was a long period of time. David, they estimate, was around 17 years old when he was anointed to be king by Samuel, and yet he was 30 years old when he became king over two of the tribes in Israel, and he was 37 years old when he actually became king over all of Israel. So that's from 17 to 37, 20 years for him to see the fulfillment of what God spoke to him. And you could just go on and on talking about different characters, that there's time involved. This goes back kind of to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 that I was talking about last week, where through, you know, you have to exercise your senses to discern both good and evil. And I was taking that word exercise and show it's something that happens over a prolonged period of time. It's not just a momentary or an instantaneous thing. And we've got to get to where we get to thinking long term instead of just, you know, believing for a brief burst of faith. We need to get patience and through faith and patience inherit the promises. And so in verse 16, it says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Again, we have moved away from this. It used to be that if a person gave you his word, that his word was his bond and that was good enough. And then uh, if you added an oath to it and swore, you know, by the Lord, I, you know, God being my witness, or you put your hand on the Bible and say, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That used to be a guarantee that a person would tell the truth. Nowadays, man, uh, people just lie with impunity and you can't hardly trust a lot of the things. Our news media is just absolute lies about all kinds of things. And so we've moved away from this, but in previous time, up until just recent time, if a person said something, or and especially if they put an oath with it, that was a guarantee that, um, you know, that would just stop all of the strife, all of the opposition. In verse 17, it says, "...wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us." Man, I need to go on and finish reading, but I don't want to pass these things up in that 18th verse it says, by two immutable things. The word immutable means unchangeable or unchangeability. In other words, it's just saying that God cannot change. He says, I'm the Lord, I change not. And then it goes on to say here that it was impossible for God to lie. Man, that's powerful. I dealt with this in the very first chapter of the book of Hebrews when the writer was talking about how that Jesus is the greatest manifestation that God has ever given to the earth. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says that He upholds all things by the word of His power. And I went into great detail talking about that, that the worlds were created by words. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be a sun, a moon, and stars, and it happened. God spoke everything into existence, and it says He upholds everything by the word of His power. Everything in this universe, every physical thing that there is, is held together by the integrity of God's word. If God was to lie, the universe would self-destruct. And I went into a lot more detail on our very first teaching on this, but this is what this is referring to. It's impossible for God to lie. And the results of that is that we should have a strong consolation. The word consolation here 
is talking about solace as one of the definitions of it. It was also translated comfort or exhortation. And so this is just talking about that we could have total confidence because it's impossible for God to lie. And we have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Boy, this, this is powerful. And again, we could spend a lot of time on this. But hope is a powerful, powerful force. Most people look at hope as actually being something that's not positive. Like I've actually heard people before, you know, that says, well, are you healed? And they'll say, well, I hope so. And I've actually heard some people before say, you don't need to be hoping. You need to believe. You need to know that it's so. Well, I admit that faith is a uh, more present tense thing than hope. Hope always in, involves the future. But in Hebrews chapter 11, I'll deal with this a lot more as we get into the 11th chapter of Hebrews. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you don't have hope, Faith doesn't have anything to bring into reality. Hope and faith are linked, and you have to have hope before you have faith. And hope is always the positive expectation of good. You can, you can have dread, which is the negative expectation of bad, but hope is specifically talking about a positive expectation of something good that is going to happen. And it says that we have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that God has given us. And then this verse 19, this hope is an anchor of the soul. You know, the word picture here is really significant. If you have a boat and if you just have that boat sitting on the water, that thing's going to float with the tide. It's going to go with the waves and things like that. But if you put an anchor down, that anchor will hold that boat in one position. But if you don't have an anchor, then you're just going to be driven with the wind and tossed. You're going to be uh, like over in James chapter 1, that the man who believes and then doubts is like a, uh, you know, a boat driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. You need an anchor in your life, something that gives you stability, and hope is that anchor. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and if you've enjoyed our program there on YouTube, I encourage you to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Share this with other people because, man, these truths will set people free. So check it out. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.